Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline. How are you today? I am doing well, Bryce. I just got back from a little vacation, so that's uh, always rejuvenating. Nice. Uh, Did you go anywhere fun, or did you just kind of do a staycation? No, I went to Canada. Ooh, so, I, I'm aware of Canada. I don't know where Canada is in the. Is it Ottawa. close to the GTA? Oh, okay. It's Ottawa. Ottawa. That, it's right outside. Kind of, it's next to Ottawa. It's it's Ottawa. You, if I wasn't visiting uh, my sister and my brother-in-law and my nephew, who all very strongly identify as canadians then uh i would usually just say i went to ottawa but uh yeah and now that you mention it from my hockey knowledge i believe that's where the ottawa senators uh building or rink is it absolutely is the canadian tire center we drove by it several times usually on our way to get ice cream uh so yeah (laughs) Well, uh, yeah, kind of a, this is going to be a weird, well, I don't want to say it's going to be a weird episode. I think we're going to have a fun episode today. As opposed Um, to all of our other normal episodes. (laughs) That's right. Um, Yeah, so as we tease in our last episode, or during our last episode, our TGIF one, which was super fun, by the way, and I encourage everybody to go back and listen to it. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so this is actually, uh, unfortunately, going to be our last episode of Overdue Finds. I'm hoping somebody who works in marketing, I just did a presentation on kind of some stuff I learned at a marketing conference that I'm hoping we will maybe be able to still do maybe the odd one-off episode here and there. So, um I mean, I might, hopefully I don't get my hands slapped for saying that, but um, I'll be doing everything I can in the back end. Hopefully we can still do the odd special here and there, but uh, you know, obviously our regular scheduled uh, one episode every other week won't be continuing. Uh, But uh, yeah, today though, uh, we're going to, I think we're going to end on a high note here and uh, you know, we've done this series of best and worst. And it's funny because this episode was actually supposed to come out before our, our TGIF one. And then we're like, okay, well, this thing's ending. <laughs> so it only makes sense for us to actually do an episode on the best and worst book endings. That's obviously being a library podcast. Uh, we've talked already about best and worst TV endings, movie endings. Um, both, you know, those have been really popular episodes for us. So, um, yeah, today, uh, I, I think we're going to have a blast, uh, talking a little bit of our best and worst, uh, book endings. And Caroline, I did tease, I did mention this to you before. I do kind of like when we go a little bit negative sometimes and, you know, we're not a negative podcast at all, but it is always kind of fun to take a look at the worst of sometimes. Well, and I think, I think that's just tapping into something that is a lot of people feel because uh, you've mentioned on the show, some of our episodes that have done the best in terms of people being able to find them and download them are the ones that we call best and worst. So I think people are really looking for the best and worst. And of course, the great thing about that is that people can agree or disagree with us. They can say, I agree, that is the best, or how could you, how dare you call that? That the worst it is my absolute favorite so oh exactly yeah so uh we always love getting feedback and you can always email caroline and myself at podcast at epl.ca um and uh today though we've got an awesome guest joining us a first time guest and uh no offense, probably last time guest as well, <laughs> this, being, this being the last episode. Uh, I want to welcome to the show for the very first time. Uh, she's a library services coordinator at our Clareview branch, uh, Tiana Luck. Tiana, uh, welcome to Overdue Finds. How are you today? Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I am good. I've wanted to be on the podcast for a while. And every time you ask for guests, I'm like, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. And like best and worst book endings, I'm like, that I know. Like, this is the one. 
Well, if it if it makes you feel any better, there's been some recent episodes where both Caroline and myself didn't really know too much about the topic. Uh, I'm thinking of like Doctor Who and Dune, so uh, that's okay. We just kind of go with the flow here and try and have a try and have a fun conversation. Uh, but I have to ask you, as somebody who works out of the Clairview branch, uh, what's your favorite part about working uh, out of Clairview? Clairview is fun because we're attached to the rec center, so I feel like we get a lot of people that like drop their kids off to do activities and then they come into the library to read a little bit. So we get a lot of people that maybe don't normally come to libraries or didn't come here specifically for the library, but they're just, their kid is doing a hockey practice and they don't want to sit there for an hour. So they just like wander around and they find us. And I think that's really fun to get a lot of new people to the library. I love that. And whenever I go to Clairview, there are two things I always check out. One is uh, your uh, window wall that overlooks the pool. I just think that's so cool. Mm. It's like a unique view among uh, libraries here. And it's kind of, yeah, like a window on the world that's still happening while you're in the library. Uh, And the other is you have some great artwork at Clairview, uh, including some that is created by sometimes some kids in in some of the classes that gets out on display. So I always love visiting Clairview. I was actually, I was going to say, I was actually just there a few weeks ago with my brother and my nephew, Cameron, and uh, they actually did a little bit of a photo shoot for us. So uh, my nephew will be popping up in maybe the odd Instagram post here or there or social media posts. So uh, yeah, a little, little overdue finds family content there. Actually, we should also touch on too, just because uh, there's been so much going on here at EPL. We, of course, uh, just wrapped up our March Madness uh, uh, tournament for this year. And of course, it was best sequel. And uh, if you were hopefully you were following the results and voting every day, but uh, best sequel, uh, the winner was Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Um, I wasn't too surprised by this outcome. It kind of it, it makes it made sense to me. Yeah, I agree. I had the same um, reaction. It hadn't been, I I can't remember how far it went on my bracket, but uh, when I thought about it, it it made sense. And I don't know, it seemed like a good, solid ending for that, thinking of endings today. So yeah, I, it was always as, it was fun as usual. We talked a little bit last time about um, some of the upsets or surprising results on there. And uh, I always love seeing those and yeah, it makes sense to me that, I mean, I would, we would have to get, best friend of the show Kate Gibson here to tell us but I imagine Tolkien kind of had it planned out you know what he wanted to do he seems like the kind of guy who would plan out where he was going with the story I would I would think so yeah there's some times where it's like oh yeah this was this was the plan all along but yeah like I think of Star Wars and it's like no, I I don't think that was the plan all along, but um... Exactly. So it makes sense to me that uh, that like a sequel that's part of a an ongoing story may like re- touches people um yes. in that. So Absolutely. Yeah. Uh Tiana, are you a Lord of the Rings fan? I can't say that I am. <laughs> I haven't read any of the books. I think I've seen all the movies. I was good. I was trying to think. I I am not a hundred percent sure that I have seen Return of the King, the movie. I definitely have not read the book. Um, so maybe maybe I should uh, check that out. All right. And speaking of things uh, to check out, uh, get ready because our first Forward Thinking Speaker Series event of 2024 is right around the corner. You don't want to miss Chris Turner, How to Be a Climate Optimist, presented by Gridworks Energy Group on April 16th at the Trifo Theatre at McEwen University. Chris Turner is one of Canada's leading voices on climate change solutions and the global energy transition. And during his presentation... He'll discuss climate solutions from around the world, and we'll share why there's a case for optimism 
in the face of the challenge of climate change. Tickets are only $10 each and are available at epl.ca slash speaker series. Uh, so, so as somebody who's helping uh, plan this event, uh, we just actually had a conversation with Chris Turner yesterday. He's super excited to be here. Um, I think it's going to be a great talk. Um, I should also mention too, uh, because I know this episode comes out about four days before the actual event. Uh, when we're recording this, I noticed there was probably a handful of tickets left. So if you're on the fence about going, um, I would definitely um, not wait till the day of because uh, this one will absolutely sell out. Exciting. It's always fun when there's uh, a full house. Yeah, so uh, before we get talking about our uh, favorite and uh, least favorite book endings, let's chat about our recent overdue finds items. Uh, Tiana, I'm going to start with you. You mentioned in kind of your email to us, you're a, you're a, you're a big reader. So um, do you have a book recommendation for us? Are you saving kind of those for uh, best and worst endings picks? Oh, no, I have so many. I've written down quite a few. But the one that I wanted to talk about that I've read recently, it's Children of Time, which is not a new book. But I just read it by Adrian Tchaikovsky. I want to say I'm saying that right, but I'm not sure. And it's a sci-fi novel set in the future. Humans need to find a new planet because Earth is no longer habitable. However, the planet they want to colonize already has sentient, really big spiders. Ooh. So you kind of get like a multi-generational thing of like humans going in deep space and the spiders just like evolving. It's very fun. It sounds a little, and correct me if I'm wrong. It sounds just, I'm thinking of like giant spiders and automatically I thought of like starship troopers a little bit, but uh sounds totally different. <laughs> I think a little bit different, but it is a very good sci-fi book if anybody wants that. Nice. Hey, is it, so you mentioned it's not new, but is it, is it no. quite a bit older or? um Ooh, I don't actually know the publication date. I can look. 2015 so it's about 10 years nice no it is it is slightly horrifying and then when the people and the spiders meet and you're like Ooh. <laughs> like how giant are these spiders are they like human size yeah they're like they're like four feet tall wow wow yeah but also as smart if or smarter than people so they're very smart. They've built like radios and stuff out of spider webs and they've completely changed their entire world to suit them in a very different way that humans would have because they, of course, are a completely different species. Yeah. Do they have language? Yes. Yeah. They've got a spoken and a written language. So they, again, write with like their spider webs and leave like knots in it to represent different concepts and stuff. And eventually they build, like, spaceships. I think there's something less, I don't even know the word, but, like, okay, a big spider that's, like, crawling up your wall, that I think I would have a harder time with than, like, a human side. Because if they're, if you just kind of, I don't know, maybe I've seen so much Star Trek that, mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, it's an, it's an alien creature, but they yeah. look like a spider versus there is an insect the size of a dinner plate, you know? <laughs> That's very fair. Yeah. Although it does kind of give you the creepy crawlies still, though, because you're like, it's still a spider and it's yeah. still huge. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Oh, I like it. It sounds like there would be a lot of uh, world building, which is something yes. I've talked about loving on the show. Caroline, uh, how about you? Uh, you were away on holidays. Uh, did you do any reading or check out any movies on your flight or? On the flight, no. I I have the shortest attention span on a flight. I can never actually watch something as long as a movie on it. I need to be flitting around uh, between different things. And I did actually do some reading on the show, but or um, on my vacation. Uh, but today on the show, I wanted to give a mention to a show that I don't think I've ever actually called an overdue find. I think I was saving it in case I was able to convince you to do an episode on it. And that is Murder, She Wrote. If you have <laughs> not checked out Murder, She Wrote, the long-running series, CBS drama mystery series starring Angela Lansbury that ran from 1984 to 1996. EPL has all 12 seasons on DVD. If you haven't seen it, pick it up. Give it a whirl. 
Um, it's, uh, yeah, so Angela Lansbury stars as Jessica Fletcher, who is a retired uh, uh, high school English teacher, recently widowed. Uh, her nephew, Grady, who we will see many times throughout the course of the series, uh, kind of surreptitiously submits her manuscript to a publisher, and then she's off and running as the hottest uh, mystery writer in American writing. Anywhere she goes, she happens to stumble on to murder. Um, you know, it happens. And uh, luckily, she's always there to take some, uh, you know, good old fashioned Mayan determination uh, to the case to face off against any police officers who say, hey, you know what? A random uh, mystery writer retired teacher really doesn't have a place in this investigation she says no i'm gonna solve the murder and she does uh spoiler alert <laughs> it's, it's not a uh in the vein of current dramas about you, know, you could go a whole season without the mystery being solved no after 44 minutes it is wrapped up neatly except for the occasional two-part episode as with many things that are 40 years old, not every episode holds up. Um, you might want to use a, a huge amount of caution anytime she encounters um, a culture that is not her own. Um, there are some unfortunate depictions uh, and, and characterizations uh, in there. There's also a stretch around seasons six and seven where uh, Angela Lansbury got a little tired carrying this show on her own. And they started like doing random episodes where she would introduce it and say, this reminds me of a story that my friend told me. And then there would be like this random <laughs> character that we never see again come in um, on that. But uh, you know, I, I, I love it. It's a comfort show for me. Uh, Murder, She Wrote. If you haven't seen it or if you want to revisit it, EPL has has all of the DVDs in our collection. Uh, yeah, It's funny because I can honestly say I've never sat down. Big shock. I've never watched an entire episode of Murder, She Wrote. I remember. I just don't know how that's possible. <laughs> I remember the theme music. And as a kid who was into hockey and pro wrestling, obviously Murder, She Wrote wasn't really up my my alley. And uh, I remember liking the opening credits because the theme music was good. But once after that came on, after that was over, then I, then I turned the channel. So here's a question for you. If I was to watch one episode of Murder, She Wrote, which one should I watch? I've thought a lot about this because <laughs> I was planning uh, for an episode of the show and I thought, which one would I get Bryce to watch? Um, and I have two answers. The first one is my favorite episode, which is her car breaks down outside an Amish community and there is a murder in that Amish community. It has excellent guest stars. The only thing it doesn't have is the traditional Cabot Cove setting, which is her small town in Maine. I would I would argue to say like, yeah, watch that one, but then watch another one. But and then the third one you should watch is um, a, a, a show from the 12th season when Murder, She Wrote had been moved to go up against Friends, which was in its, uh, I think, second season and uh, just a ratings. It was a phenomenon. And here was Angela Lansbury competing with, you know, <laughs> Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer. Uh, she does a murder. There's an episode set uh behind the scenes of a friends like sitcom called buds and there are <laughs> so many veiled references that are just so obvious like it's it's you, you you have to watch it and i think as someone who likes uh tv and tv history that that one would appeal to you on that well i yeah i, I need to check these out now so uh yeah, I clearly have uh, done a disservice all these years by not checking out Murder, She Wrote. But uh, Caroline, I will definitely watch watch a couple of those for sure. I hope so. So at the I, I if I kept going, I would just turn this into my Murder, She Wrote episode. So Bryce, what have you enjoyed lately? Uh, so like you, my pick is also on something that I, had the show kind of kept going we would have eventually done this episode. One of those episodes we've joke, we've half jokingly talked about doing for years 
was a pro an episode about pro wrestling. We even actually had one of our staff members reach out and be like, Hey, you should do this episode. I know some people who wrestle locally, uh, locally on the independent scene who we can have on. And that we, we would probably have done that episode here over the next few months. So my pick today is tied into uh, pro wrestling and it's a movie that uh, came out around Christmas time. Uh, that I highly recommend. So uh, that movie, of course, is The Iron Claw, which we now have in our collection. So uh, if you're not familiar with The Iron Claw, uh, the film tells the true tragic story of the famous Von Erich wrestling family. Uh, the film stars Zach Efron as Kevin Von Erich, who's the oldest of the wrestling brothers uh, who have to follow in their father's footsteps. So uh, their father, Fritz, who owns World Class Championship Wrestling, which, uh, is based, which was based out of Dallas, Texas in the 80s, and his biggest act were his children, uh, Kevin, David, Carrie, and Mike. So the movie, uh, we see the rise of the family and the very uh, tragic and unfortunate fall, uh, which in an industry that's taken, unfortunately, quite a few lives too early. Uh, the film also stars Jeremy Allen White, who most people know from uh, Shameless or The Bear. Uh, he plays Carrie Von Erich, who actually ended up becoming a champion in the WWF as the Texas Tornado. So... Um, now the movie, I wish I was kind of having a little bit more of a of a feel good uh, pick this week, but uh, this movie is really not that um, there, and it's unfortunate too because there's actually a whole other brother that's not even in the movie that's not mentioned in the movie because the family has faced so much tragedy, and the writer and the director was like, "This is sad enough as it is," so unfortunately we're going to uh, omit this one brother, but. Um, the Von Erich family supported the movie and everything. So um, I think that's why I'll, one of the main reasons why I'm uh, recommending it in addition to it being a great movie. Um, and of course, uh, you know, after you watch this and you want to learn more about the Von Erichs, um, I would recommend checking out, uh, there's a TV show called Dark Side of the Ring. It's produced by Vice. Uh, we don't have it in our collection, but you can watch it on Crave or I believe, uh, the free streaming service to be has uh, old episodes and it's in season one and it's called uh, the last of the Von Eriks. So uh, that gives you a little bit more of a uh, accurate look at the family, but uh, the movie, the iron claw itself is great. Um, you don't have to be a fan of pro wrestling to enjoy it. It's just uh, it's a great story and um, yeah, it has an unfortunate ending, but uh, still, still a great movie though. There was a clip that was circulating right after the movie came out. Uh, I think it's uh, from a wedding reception scene, and mm -hmm. it's uh, the family and these these actors and the brothers uh, line dancing to uh, "Thank God I'm a Country Boy." Is it? I think so. Yeah. I think something like that. And I mean, Zac Efron just does like is so good in this short scene. Every time I saw it, I would think, "Oh yeah, I gotta watch this." And then I would remember reading the Wikipedia page and just messaging you and going, oh, no. And then like three seconds later, what? No. And then <laughs> and then it just kept going on there. And I'm like, mm, this whole movie is probably not going to be about happy line dancing. So No, unfortunately, it's not. There's just maybe a couple minutes of uh, line dancing, but uh, it's, it's still worth checking out, though. Well, I'll just go online and watch that clip then. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it today. Uh, the best and worst book endings. Uh, I love doing these be best and worst uh, episodes. Um, but before we, you know, chat about give our picks anyway, uh, Tiana, um, you know, I have to ask you, you know, as somebody you mentioned to us that, you know, you read a ton of books, um, I guess for you, uh, what what do you think are some of the elements that make a good book ending? For me personally, because I do think it's very subjective and is mm -hmm. very different for every person. I like an ending that is a surprise. So I like it when I don't see what is going to happen or when it you think that the book is like a certain genre and you get like a little bit of a twist at the end and you're like, oh, OK, this is not exactly what I thought that this was going to be. Sometimes that doesn't go well and then it turns into a bad book ending. But if they do it well then I think it's a good book ending, having that little bit of a twist, a little bit of a surprise. 
Yeah, I completely agree. I love. I have come to realize I'm a big fan of the surprise ending. Um, and it when done well, um, it kind of has me thinking about the book after I put it down. Uh, when it's not done well, I uh, it like casts a shadow over the rest of the story. Um, and it's interesting because as much as I love like a surprise or a twist or something that that kind of shakes me at the end uh the first word that came to mind for me was satisfying and i don't know that that's a very clear answer like what it's like okay caroline well what makes a satisfying ending like on this but but just something that i think because of how long you've spent with a book um and also i read a lot of non-fiction as well and um i think you know this this concept of of just the ending is is kind of just where you stop the story uh it doesn't necessarily like things sometimes keep going on outside of the view of the narrative um so having a satisfying which doesn't necessarily mean happy but just an ending that that leaves me you know feeling good about the time i've put into reading the book so yeah a very personal answer there bryce what uh what do you need in a book um, yeah, I think it totally depends on what you're reading. Very similar to what um, Tiana mentioned. Um, yeah, you do go on, like you said, you're reading this book, you know, versus, you know, comparing a book ending to maybe a movie ending. Obviously, you're spending way more time with the book than you are a movie. And I think, you know, in the case of movies, sometimes like, let's say you're watching a superhero movie, it's almost like you're programmed to expect some sort of like, I need some sort of like, big reveal at the end, or I need this other character just to kind of make an appearance, you know, during the, during the end credits. It'd be funny if there was something like that in books where it's like the story ends and you have to flip through like 10 pages of publisher's notes. And then it's like, Oh, this guy showed up at the very end. Um, but, uh, yeah, it totally depends. I think on, yeah, what you're, what you're reading. Um, did you at least enjoy that journey that you were on? And I think that's kind of what it, what it boils down to a lot of times. Yeah, I think for for me, like thinking of, and again, spoilers on here, we're going to talk about endings, and I'm going to start with one of the, the most famous movie twists, it, which was, um, there's something about a movie being visual, and, and you're kind of shown stuff. And so at the end, if you're given a, a reveal that's like, oh, what you thought you were seeing wasn't what you were seeing, and I'm thinking of something like Sixth Sense, you know, the Bruce Willis twist on that, Um that to me is more powerful in uh than when I'm reading and it's it's uh, what you thought was happening wasn't what was happening and I'm thinking of the ending to uh the book Atonement uh in particular which has kind of an ending that's like oh just kidding this isn't the story actually this never happened and it's like oh oh okay well I was imagining the whole thing so that doesn't actually do it for me in the end. Um, and so uh, I think being able to play in that space, again, I'm a character reader. I love characters. I love this world building. And then you just kind of let the characters go. Um, and having that that satisfying ending that, that like marries the characters and the story. Um, I think there are elements to a book that uh, you need that, that are different from what makes a good movie ending. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any books that you think have a particularly memorable ending? Not necessarily good or bad, but ones that have really stuck with you. Tiana. This one is hard. Because <laughs> I'm like, all the memorable ones that I'm thinking of, I could probably fit within a good or bad category. And they can be good or bad, but just like, what was there one that like, you know, really kind of... I don't know, it punched you in the stomach with it with the <laughs> ending. I read the book Tender is the Flesh, and it is not a horror book, but it is horrifying. Because mm. it's it's basically a world we're allowed spoilers, right? We've put yes. in a Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a world where all of the animals that people eat got like this disease, so then we can't eat animals anymore. But instead of going to just, like, everybody's a vegetarian, it goes into, well, we can eat people. So it's it's like a cannibalism book, but it is a literary fiction, 
and you just you want it the main character at the end to be like this is bad we shouldn't eat people and that is not what you get he's just like well i guess we just eat people now like it was just, <laughs> like oh it just gets you and you're like oh my god it sticks with you a little bit just with the emotions that it leaves and it wasn't like a twist it wasn't a surprise it's kind of what the whole book was was about it wasn't any different than that but i don't know it just sticks in my brain yeah it's like this is the story we've been telling throughout this book so it's mm-hmm. like obviously that's that's how we're gonna that's how we're gonna end this don't be surprised by it mm-hmm. but yeah i could totally see you know you're reading something like that and you probably would expect some sort of like moral you know somebody with good morals yeah. at the end to be like no this isn't right we can't be doing this and then it's like the moralistic ending of like this is a wrong thing to do and that is not what you get they're like no this whole book we've been telling you people eat people like that's just how it goes this is the world this is how it works and that's how it ends and it just keeps on going yeah <laughs> caroline did you have any uh endings like that that uh really i guess stuck with you yeah. wasn't necessarily good or bad and i think that i think that you you got it tiana when you mentioned like that emotional reaction um two that came to mind were ones where um you see it's it's an emotional story that you you at the end um you're kind of taken in a different direction um the two that came to mind for me were uh chris bohallian's uh midwives which was an oprah pick in the 90s um about a uh home birth situation that went terribly wrong and the subsequent trial involving the the midwife uh and uh jody picolt's my sister's keeper uh which kind of again was another a medical drama involving a court trial maybe i just really love these court um dramas um that at the end and midwives has kind of a, a last minute like a, a last page reveal that kind of changes things and uh kind of clarifies what you've been experiencing um my sister's keeper has kind of that um whiplash ending of of changing what you thought you were working towards uh but both are were really kind of focused in on having an emotional reaction uh to it um and they're the kind of books that you kind of like put down at the end and you need to almost catch your breath after reading it so um i read both of those easily 20 midwives maybe 25 30 years ago and um uh yeah they both kind of stuck with me since then what about you bryce what has there been an ending to something that just really kind of stuck with you yeah uh, for me it was uh, i've mentioned this book on the show before but uh for me it was the ending to the book not the movie uh world war z um you know it's by uh written by max brooks who's actually uh the son of legendary uh comedian mel brooks and uh the book itself if you're not aware of it it's uh basically this oral report on on this zombie war and uh what i love about the book is that it's not just like one narrative it's we get these actual like reports from people who were you know on the front lines in the war people who were in the medical field all these different people who were part of um kind of played pivotal roles within kind of this whole zombie apocalypse thing and now what the ending stuck with me because I think a lot of times in books like this or definitely in movies, it's like, you know, there's a big battle at the end and, you know, the the credits roll or, you know, the book ends and, and that's it. Like it's, it's over. But what I liked about the book is like, it actually goes into details on like, okay, well, you know, the world's been fighting this horrible, this horrible battle for the last 10 years or whatever it was. Uh, But these are like the effects of that war. And it's like, you know, it basically there was so many fires going on. It was like the equivalent of like two nuclear bombs go- going off. Um, 
people from the U.S. ended up migrating into Canada up north uh, because it was cold and that's where zombies couldn't walk. So just some of those like details I thought was like really cool. Obviously, it's fiction, but it was just something I thought it was like a really cool way to kind of wrap up a book and just kind of be like, you know, this horrible thing happened, but there's also this horrible other stuff that's happening with the environment now because of this. And it was like a realistic look at, you know, something that, you know, obviously did not or will not happen. So, uh, yeah, that, that ending really has really stuck with me. Uh, yeah, I read that book probably about 15 years ago or so, but, uh, yeah, it's something that it's always stuck with me anyway. So of course we like to stay positive on overdue fines, but we have to talk about disappointing endings uh so uh, what i like about these episodes too is we also share some picks from uh staff at epl too so uh past guest josh carr shared with us uh the manga blue flag and its ending are a mixed bag for me i think the ending it wanted was really good and it's proof that life can take you all sorts of directions but i kind of wish it had one or two more chapters to it because i wanted to I wanted to know more about the lives of the characters after the fact. How were their relationships going? What sort of things did they experience? So uh, I think we've all kind of experienced that sometimes with, you know, different books uh, that w- that we've read and we're like, oh my God, what happened to that person? But uh, I guess, uh, Tiana, uh, which endings left you uh, disappointed? So I'm going to sort of refer to what Caroline had said about atonement and how like at the end it was like, oh, none of this really happened. So there's a series. None I'm gonna... of it happened. None of it. <laughs> yeah, like, no, yeah. like, uh, it's like, oh, okay. You th- None of it happened. It's fiction. Yeah, sorry. I so just... I had read the series called Queen of the Tearling. And it's a fantasy series. And there's three or four books. I can't quite remember. So you're going through the series. It's multiple books. You're like invested in the characters. You're like, yeah, you got to save your world. You got to overrule the ruling class and say no to tyranny and then at the very end they're like on a boat and you're like i don't know how this is gonna end there's only like this much of the book left like there's nothing left and there is no resolution in sight like what is going to happen here and they get to the very end and then they're like time travel none of this happened we're just gonna erase the entire series and say that none of it happened the main character just becomes a librarian in a city (laughs) like it it does like (laughs) it erased everything and i was so mad I'm like, this is not worth it. I have spent so many hours for you to tell me that none of the characters meet. The main romance doesn't end up really together because they didn't know each other because they didn't go through any of this. And they just took it all away. And I was angry. I like just hearing that makes me want to throw this book across the room. I've only ever done that to one book, but like if I was reading this, I would just I would I would throw it at that point. And it was a good series. Like I liked the first few books. I was into it. And then the last one, were there hints at all? Like like once you kind of got over the initial what is happening were there hints that this had been set up the whole time hints in the last book a little bit i don't it doesn't feel like it was set up for it from book one the feeling that i got from it was like "Eh, maybe they were she meant to do a resolution with it and then got to the last book and didn't quite know how to finish it and she's like i can just toss in this magic stone thing (laughs) That will just take it all away, and that will sum it up. I was like, I'm I'm bored of writing this series. Let's yeah. just let's just end this thing. Yeah. So it it didn't feel very cohesive throughout the series. So I've talked to other people who have also read it, and we all agree. <laughs> but it's not a good, <laughs> it's a good written series. It's just that ending. Yeah. Makes it not worth it. That's got to be tough, though, too, because then, like, people who are, like, maybe want to pick up the first two books, they're like, is this even worth it then? If the ending is, you know, if you hear the ending is absolutely terrible. Yeah. It's not one I recommend. No. (laughs) Did you have any other uh, books that really disappointed you in the ending? I have a few. (laughs) So (laughs) I have a list. I just wasn't sure how many I should talk about. No, that's fine. This is what the people want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> what, what they want to the hear worst? the anger. <laughs> 
So I've read The Glass Castle, which is a nonfiction book. It's pretty popular. It was a good book. The prologue had Jeanette, the main character, like living in a penthouse and she's rich and she's so well off. And then you go like through her life and how she really wasn't and her family situation was not great. And they were they were very poor. And then you get to the very end again and you realize that, oh, it was just her boyfriend's apartment that she's already broken up with. So she lived in that penthouse for maybe a month and it just felt like false advertising at the beginning of like, look at me, I'm rich. I've done so well. I live like in this New York City penthouse. Like I am doing great. And then you get to the end and you're like, no, you are, you're still doing great, but you're maybe a little more middle-class average and less upper-class rich. And yeah, I don't know. It just felt like they were trying to contrast that at the beginning a little bit. And it, at the end, you realize that wasn't actually quite true. Yeah, I definitely see that being a little little false advertising. Yeah, and I'm like, it's a nonfiction book, so it is her story. Yeah. It wasn't, <laughs> I don't believe it was a lie. Like, it, it happened mm-hmm. to her. That is her life. It just, the way they presented it, yeah. I didn't like that it was misleading. Yeah. Understandable. I think that, and I think that's true for in in a lot of nonfiction fiction and even thinking Bryce what you were saying about the Iron Claw movie and and like there was another brother and like the movie itself is not holding itself out as a documentary or a, mm-hmm. a, this is a hundred percent accurate of what happened and it's like but you've but you erased a whole person in this um when nonfiction still has choices made about how it structures a story or how it presents it or, or what kind of literary devices it uses on the way to get to that. And I think that it's important that those work cohesively have that coherence around um, what it's ultimately presenting. And so if it's going for this, or maybe it wanted there to be a bit of a twist, but I don't, I I also read the glass castle and I don't remember it trying to be like a shocker ending. I think it was just not as strong a, a comparison as, as it was initially set up as. And I think, yeah, there could have been um, a different way of going about that. So you have one more pick do you want to share? One more pick that I want to share, and it's The Heart Goes Last by Margaret Atwood. And I love Margaret Atwood. She's a great writer. I'm very much a fan, but I don't like this one. (laughs) So throughout the whole book, the main characters are just annoying. (laughs) They're not, they don't learn. They don't change. You get to the end and you're like, you're still just as annoying as you were at the beginning. You don't take any responsibility for your feelings or your actions. There is no personal growth. And I was just like, well, what was the point? I want them to to learn something. I want them to get better and not just be horrible people the whole time. (laughs) Well, Tiana, you're in luck because I'm not sure if you noticed, but we just announced our full forward thinking speaker series lineup. We will be hosting Margaret Atwood here in Edmonton in November. So um, as somebody who's helping organize that event, maybe we can have you chat with her about that book. (laughs) You're like, no, I'm good. (laughs) I am waiting though. I'm like, as soon as I figure out when tickets are going to go on sale, I'm going to have to be like, on top of it because I think she's going to be a very popular forward thinker speaker series so I think I'm going to need to buy tickets right away to make sure that I can go to that event yeah and I I will say not to kind of uh sidetrack the conversation that uh the event will be at the the jube so uh it's going to be definitely the one of the larger venues uh here in the city so we'll have well over probably 1500 tickets available for sale and i believe tickets will probably go on sale in late september so uh just watch our website and, and social media but uh yeah it's definitely gonna be one of the biggest events that we've we've hosted for sure because she's great of course yeah caroline uh how about you like what what are some of those books that you're like you're just like no this this was horrible like i know you like to read a lot of murder mysteries do you have any of those picks 
not really. Those ones I kind of, uh, it either works for me and it doesn't, and then I just kind of move on from it. Um, also, they start to run together. Uh, I read a lot of the same quote unquote book. Um, and so, like, it, it, it either, they don't tend to stick with me um, after that, after I read them. The one that comes to mind for me when I think of an ending that I had like a physical reaction to was the book I Am David by Anne Holm. This was a book I read in um, in school. I think it was grade nine. And it's the story. And so it's like a middle grade novel. Um, it's the story of a boy who's about 12, who is in a European constant, like, concentration work camp after the end of world war ii and he escapes um he has like five things with him in his little uh satchel and he makes his way to denmark where he believes his mother is the book is 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 what it is but my problem with it was the pacing for chapter after chapter we have david like in the wilderness climbing these mountains finding some children and getting close to them and then realizing people let you down like all of this stuff in the last like page and a half the last like five paragraphs he crosses multiple countries makes his way to denmark figures out where his mother lives goes to meet his mother says to her I am David and she responds and that's the end of the book like in the last page and a half <laughs> of a book we spent probably months reading and and to be fair I think it is possibly due to having to read it for school and you know everything gets drawn out and if I had just been sitting and reading it I might have had a different reaction to it but it was a page and a half where he goes through multiple country I just the pacing didn't work <laughs> for me that totally sounds like, yeah, the author was like, okay, this is probably going to be way too long. So How I many gotta... words did I have to submit to the publisher? Okay, and done. Um, it's it. Many people love this book. It was made into a movie in the early 2000s. Um, the author, I believe, died in the 90s, in 1990s. And um, yeah, it's, it wasn't for me. Maybe if there's a passionate I Am David fan base, it's also had a couple different names, David being one of them. It was originally published in um, a different language. Maybe that also had something to do uh, with it. Uh, maybe not working for me quite as well. So there's, I know I'm throwing up some fences here on why this wasn't the ending I wanted it to be, but it was just, it was a page and a half and so much <laughs> happened. And we had just done so little for so long on um, in this book. So uh, yeah, if you've read, I am David, I would love to get your thoughts on it. <laughs> kind of reminds me just when you're talking about it, just having to like wrap it up so quickly, kind of like, I haven't read any of the books, but um, like the last season of game of Thrones, I know it seemed like, it was like, okay, like this stuff that probably should have lasted over two or three seasons is wrapped up in two episodes. So we've traveled half the country and just everything has got to wrap up because we've only got two episodes left. So yeah, <laughs> that's, I can totally see that being frustrating, just the, the pacing part for sure. Yeah. So that's when I think of an ending that, that disappointed me, this has always been the book that I've come back to. So yeah, sorry, I am David. <laughs> what about you, Bryce? What um, what ending disappointed you? Uh, I would have to go with. Uh, I got to bring up a Stephen King book here on, I was on this waiting. last episode. I, I was waiting. I'm like, <laughs> what's it gonna? Is it gonna be The Shining? Is it gonna be The Mist? The Stand? I didn't know where this was going. No, uh, close. I did think about The Shining, the book. I'm one of those people who actually prefer the movie over the book, but um, for me, it's Stephen King's It um, is the ending that I'm like, uh, no, what? No, no. Um, for the most part, 
I I absolutely love this book. I think I joked on the show that it took me like a year to read this thing because it's so thick. And at the time when I was reading it, I was catching the bus and the train to work every day. So um, our former marketing director, Anna Alfonso, would laugh at me because I'd be carrying this giant brick of a book with me in my backpack to work like every single day so I could, so I could read it on my commute. But um, yeah, it's and it's funny because like I actually think it's like I really do for the most part – think it's some of his best work. Um, I especially love, you know, when he's describing uh, the town that it's set in Derry, Derry Maine. Um, it's just this evil place. And actually, um, I just saw yesterday online, we're actually getting a Derry Maine uh, miniseries. So uh, it's kind of a more of a prequel series to uh, the events in it. So I will obviously be checking that out. But, and I think the part that bugged me the most about the ending, and I can't, I cannot talk about it on this show and because of just the content, obviously, if somebody's read, if anybody has read the book and you're listening to this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, of course, I'm talking about the kids trying to find their way out of um, the the sewer system in Derry after uh, they face Pennywise. Um, it's just, it's, it's gross. It's um, just, it's unnecessary. And I remember reading it and I was just like, ugh. like it just, it almost took me out of the whole thing and maybe not even like the book. So, um, it also gets really convoluted too with like, you know, spoilers, there's like aliens and just weird entities and, and stuff like that. So, um, Stephen King kind of has this reputation of not really being able to kind of stick some of his, the landings on some of his endings. And I would definitely put, um, this is probably a prime example a of of that theory so um yeah for the most part really enjoy the book but um just the ending the ending left me definitely disappointed for as long as for how long that book was and how long it took me to read it uh tiana have you read it i have not i have read some stephen king i've read the shining but i haven't read he's got so many so many books i have oh, seen yeah. the movie okay yeah well you know it's funny too because even i think back to the the movie so like chapter one and chapter two chapter one i absolutely love and you know i think about when i'm reading the book and those are some of my favorite parts for like when it's actually with the kids and and obviously you know when you're talking about kids being in danger obviously there's a little bit more um a little bit more emotion there and uh, the stakes seem to obviously to be a lot higher when, you know, when we're talking about kids being in danger with, you know, Pennywise, the clown um, chapter two, um, the, the movie, I definitely didn't like as much as the first one. Uh, mostly once again, because of the ending, I think mostly was one of the other things I didn't really care much for, but uh, if you're a King fan, it's definitely must, you know, it's it's required reading for Stephen King fans. I'll I'll say it that way. Well, let's end today's discussion on a more positive note. Uh, past guest Beth Kilfoy shared with us uh, that uh, the book Molly of the Mall by Heidi L M Jacobs, uh, which is a Stephen King. Stephen King medal winner <laughs> for humor. No. <laughs> Wrong, Stephen. Okay. Uh, so Molly of the Mall by Heidi L.M. Jacobs, a Stephen Leacock medal for humor winner, uh, and set here in Edmonton. Uh, she wrote that she adored the whole novel. It so perfectly captured life as a young woman studying English at university, even if it was set 20 years before she, Beth, went to the U of A, and also re reflected her own abiding love for Jane Austen novels. The book was a delight from the beginning, and the ending made me so happy I cried. I genuinely don't know if I've ever read a book that made me so happy that I cried, but I'm glad Beth got to experience that. Uh, so which endings stand out to you as being really great ones? Tiana? Oh, I have, I feel like I have more good endings than I have bad endings because good. I drop books. <laughs> so if I'm not liking a book, I just ditch it. So yes, there's a lot of books that I probably wouldn't like, but I never get to it. Some of the ones that I've really enjoyed is The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemison, And that one won a bunch of like sci-fi awards as well. The whole series is great, but the first book in particular 
was so good. It follows three characters. You have Essen, Demea, and Sinite. And you think that all these things are happening at the same time because you get like one chapter for each and then you cycle through them again. And you're figuring out this whole world because it's a whole big sci-fi speculative fiction fantasy thing. And there's people that can control like earthquakes with their minds. So that's kind of fun. But then they can also like create the earthquakes and not just solve earthquakes that are happening so then other people are scared of them because they don't want to be you know killed which is fair (laughs) and so you're going through all these characters and at the very end of the book you realize that all three characters are the same person just at different stages of life so you get like one as a child one as like a mother one is like a middle-aged woman so you kind of see how her life progressed but all at the same time and yeah at the end you realize it was all one person and it was just done so well so well that's the type of ending we talked a little bit about like the twist ending the Mm -hmm. the the ending that kind of shakes everything up i also really like the ending that clicks everything into focus that like you've been reading maybe there were different strands or different characters or different pieces and then at the end it just like brings it and it's like ah that was in alignment the whole time that the click ending nk jemison all of her books she she plans them out very well and like the whole series that she does too you know that she's planned them all from the beginning because it all the threads are throughout everything but yeah, the fifth season I think is my favorite book of hers. Yeah, there's there's um a comfort in that. I think we I probably talked about this on uh, in in some of our movie episodes. We've done a few Overdue Finds episodes on movies, but when it seems like the the creator knows what you're doing, you can settle in with it and you're not having to be like okay now what's going on what like you can ease and like relax a little bit and and really enjoy yourself and hand yourself over a little bit which um i think makes for a more enjoyable experience in in reading or watching or doing anything like that because you trust that they're going to bring you to a good spot at the end yeah Mm -hmm. you don't have to worry as being like oh what's gonna happen you yeah. know it's going to be good because you can trust the author. And you're not in that space of, because I also um, don't finish books if it doesn't seem like it's going, but when you're still kind of deciding when you're giving it like the 50 pages or a couple chapters or whatever this is, you haven't um, committed yet. Like you're still waiting to see. You ha- you can't settle into that because you're still like, well, am I going, like, is this yes or no on this? And so I think just being able to just sink into it and and not have that like do I keep reading but I can't stop reading um, is a really good distinction there mm-hmm. and I'm realizing now that I'm looking at all my book lists and they're all like apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what that says about me that all of my favorite book endings are apocalypse books <laughs> well it gives so much uh, space to mm-hmm. um, have again characters and worlds but um for for story to happen and for characters to be facing things that challenge them um and and bringing people together and depending on each other like it's a really rich area for for characters but also plot yeah do you have any other ones another another one that i really want to talk about is day zero by robert c cargal which is a robot apocalypse so the main character is a robot. It is a nanny bot. So it is a giant tiger robot whose whole job is to take care of this child. So it's like a six-year-old kid. This is his job. He looks after this kid. He makes sure this kid is safe. And this kid has a giant tiger robot to play with and love. <laughs> and then there's also like maid bots. Like there's robots that do a bunch of different functions in society. And then one day the robot's break free and they all get their freedom and get to make their own choices and aren't constrained by their coding in the same way and they just murder everybody so all the people are dying so everybody's going and this one robot is like but i still like my child that i am in charge of so i'm going to keep this child alive 
from all the other robots that are trying to wipe out all of humanity. So he's just like this one little tiger robot, which is a nanny bot, so he doesn't have any like fighting skills. And he's trying to keep the small child alive in an apocalypse. And it is a book that I wasn't expecting to cry at the end, but like I got to the end and I'm just like full tears because he's found he found a little spot for his kid to live out the rest of his days and a bunch of other nanny bots. They all like combine forces and make like a little compound for all the children that they were supposed to take care of. And these kids are kind of now in a jail for the rest of their lives because they can't leave. Because robots have taken over the world. It was a successful apocalypse for the robots. Humanity is gone. There's just like this handful of children that these nanny bots decide to take care of until they pass away for natural causes. And it's so, (laughs) it touched my heart so much. And it was, yeah, it was just very good. I have to say, I'm not a big sci-fi reader, but that sounds really good. I have to check that one out. Yeah. That that really like uh, I think I referenced it a little earlier, but I think a lot about how you know when you think of something having a happy ending or a sad ending, and a happy ending depends on when you stop telling the story. You know, they lived happily ever after. Really, like that's it, and that's why you know when we have sequels and things like that, um, it can be hard to have it be going forward with momentum without undoing kind of a resolution that's come before that and so the the point there about you know like yeah what kind of lives do these kids have in this uh world and what do they face and is this the happy ending but it depends on where you stop telling the story in that um and these are again it really intentional choices that the the authors make and um the when it works it can it can be um a really great mix of these thoughts that keep you kind of wondering and thinking about what happened next which i know josh referenced um earlier you know that they wanted more from from the book itself um and i get that but it's you know thinking of where does the story end and and how do i get the the reader to that point um definitely that authorial kind of oversight is something that i would say needs to be part of a strong ending bryce how about you which endings stood out to you uh well for me uh similar to tiana actually um my the the ending for my book or it's actually a graphic novel definitely kind of ties into the apocalypse and and themes of it anyway so um it's a book that uh i listed as one of my top five on our top five favorite books episode. Uh, of course it's uh, Watchmen, the graphic novel from, uh, Alan Moore. And, uh, for me, um, you know, I guess looking at that ending, first of all, I got to back up here and I should note that the graphic novel itself is kind of set in this alternate 1980s where superheroes are real and have been outlawed and uh you know it really because the graphic novel itself kind of came out in the in the mid 80s kind of this whole like cold war you know the world being on this the brink of this nuclear war is um very much kind of at the heart of of watchmen and uh so the way it ends though and of course huge spoilers here um one of the superheroes, kind of Ozymandias, creates a disaster that wipes out pretty much all of New York City. So it kills millions of kills millions of people. Um, and uh, now what's interesting about this, though, is uh, because he does this, this actually brings the world together. People see this horrible disaster. All these countries, Russia, America... They all come together and are like, this This was absolutely horrible, this thing that um, happened. But uh, the only people who kind of know about that Ozymandias created this disaster are some of the other heroes within uh, The Watchmen. One of these other heroes, of course, is Rorschach. And he actually ends up uh, losing his life because he thinks that this whole plan is insane and they shouldn't go through with this. Um, of course it happens. Um, but before Rorschach dies though, he leaves, uh, 
leaves his journal with this uh, small kind of newspaper within New York City and just kind of delivers it to them. So at the end of uh, the novel and everything, we see that, you know, the world's starting to kind of build back up and this fake disaster was, you know, despite it costing the lives of millions of people, perhaps saved the entire planet because now there's not this, you know, nuclear holocaust that's going to, that's going to happen. Uh, but when he delivers this notebook, of course, to the newspaper, um, we kind of end on this shot of Rorschach's journal just sitting there. And is the newspaper going to discover it? Are they just going to think he, this is another crazy person and then just disregard it? So there's, it kind of makes you think a little bit and you're like, well, obviously what happened was wrong, but, you know, should the world know what really happened here and kind of makes you question a few things. And, uh, I just absolutely love the, love the ending, kind of this open book ending of kind of making you think like, Oh my God, like, should they publish it? Shouldn't they? Um, yeah, it just, I absolutely love it. And it's, I think it's one of the reasons why it's my, one of my favorite books of all time. Caroline, how about you? What do you, for you, what is yeah. uh, one of your uh, one of your favorite endings? I uh, there were two that really stood out to me. Two of my favorite books. I've talked about them both on the podcast. I'm pretty sure, uh, probably in our top five favorite books episode. <laughs> so if you haven't listened to that one recently, well, listen to me now and then go back and listen to that one. Uh, the first is uh, the Cider House Rules, and um, I realized here like what stood out to me was full circle. It's the story of um, a boy who grows up in an orphanage in Maine. Maine is getting a lot of press today between Stephen King and Murder, <laughs> She Wrote and John Irving. Um, Maine. Hi. Hey, Tourism Board of Maine is <laughs> unfortunately not sponsoring this episode, but uh, hit us up. We can add you after. Yeah. Uh, so uh, he grows up in um, uh, an orphanage, is kind of raised by this doctor figure, and, and the book is the story of his life as he leaves and goes out and, and kind of sets up this this life for himself that um, he finds himself being drawn into things that he never intended to and, and things he fights against and just right and wrong and being of use and having just this perspective on on his life and then at the end um the doctor at the orphanage dies and homer the main character um goes to be the new doctor there kind of fulfilling the duties that um he had been trained to do the book um it was made into a movie released in 1999 the movie tells about like half of the book but um it, it it leaves like this whole other part where where um homer um you know continues on for like 15 years and has a son and all of these things and and uh, just the way it plays with identity and uh family and responsibility um but just him kind of coming back in a way that is totally earned by the novel so yeah that would had me thinking about full circle um and then that reminded me of one of my other favorite books which is the outsiders which mm -hmm. start by se hinton um and it starts with the line when i stepped out into the bright sunlight from the darkness of the movie house i had only two things on my mind paul newman and a ride home um and that is a line that i think of every time i come out of a movie theater Theater. and like I've been in the dark and especially because I go to the one the city center a lot and it has like that skylight in there and when you, you come out and it, it's day but it feels like you've been in the dark for so long and you're blinking I think of th that reference in the outsiders all the time but the Outsiders tells the story of a uh, pony boy, a greaser uh, from the wrong side of the tracks. Um, he goes through these things. He uh, is involved with a fight that turns fatal. He has to go into hiding. There's a fire. People die. It's, you know, it's all of these things. And then um, at the end, he's, you know, been through all this and he's having a hard time uh, in school. And so the teacher makes him a deal and says, okay, if you if you write this if you write me something if you turn in a, a writing exercise i'll 
you know, well, that'll get your grades up. So Pony Boy sits down and he opens the book and he starts writing. When I stepped out into the bright sunlight from the darkness of the movie house, <laughs> I had only two things on my mind, Paul Newman and a ride home. And it's just one of those full circle moments. And uh, it's not going to work for every story, but in those, uh, I really like where they draw the ending. So those are my my really satisfying endings. Wow. Well, that is a fantastic way to uh, wrap it up before we head into, of course, quick round table questions. And uh, Caroline, did you want to lead this one off? Sure. Yeah. Uh, first question. If you could change the ending to any book, which one would it be? And what would your new ending look like? Tiana. I would change the Queen of the Tearling ending. I don't know what I would change it to. Anything. Not sure what ending I would want. <laughs> one that doesn't erase it. Good. I like that. Bryce? So I kind of cheated on my answer here, and I apologize because I'm really not answering the question, I don't think, but it's more of a pet peeve of mine. Uh, biographies that come out too soon. Um, we need to put, I don't know how we as a society are like, no, it's too early for you to be having a biography. Sports are terrible for this. Um, I think it was earlier this year or maybe last year. Um, I, one of my overdue finds picks was, uh, the book LeBron by, uh, Jeff Benedict. And it's a great book and gives you, you know, lets you know more about you know, the story of, you know, the history of LeBron James and how he was brought up and it's well researched and everything, but LeBron's still playing and his, his son is probably going to be playing in the NBA with him. And there's a whole other second book there that will be really good, but I kind of wish they had waited a little bit. And I was just looking last night at my bookshelf and I remember in the eighties, Wayne Gretzky had his biography come out and it ends with him playing, you know, for the LA Kings and there's so much more to his career. And I'm just like, especially sports biographies, let's wait until the person has retired, give it a couple of years. You know, we just, we need me, we need a little bit more time with our biographies. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe a place like the hall of fame in hockey has requirements on you know, Pete, somebody being retired, they're, they're not just letting anyone in mid career. No, correct? no, not yeah. at all. Yeah. The only time that's happened was for Mario Lemieux, a little bit of hockey nerdum coming out here. And, uh, but that was, that was it. And it was because people thought he had retired and then he got better and then he came back. But yeah, let's, let's wait till they're retired. Give it two years after their retirement. Then let's have that biography come out. So that's that's my long-winded answer there. <laughs> Caroline, which ending would you choose? I came this close to also cheating on it, too, and I wrote the question, <laughs> but um, uh, I couldn't get away. I was like, which ending would you change? And I was like, Avengers Endgame. And then um, <laughs> I was like, right, no, not, not a movie. And then th I would start thinking about that again. And so I'm on record with that. But the only one I could really think of, uh, and I don't actually feel that strongly about it, uh, is Little Women. Does Meg could live? And um, then that would be different. So a lot of them, you know, it's like, oh, I want someone so to end up with so and so. Like, I don't, I don't think Joe and Lori should end up together. But um, does does her sister need to die? I I think she could probably live, and it would still be fine. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't end like when Mo Sislak is reading it in The Simpsons. <laughs> it's like they were no longer little girls. They were little women. <laughs> For years, I thought that's how the book actually ended. <laughs> like, I have checked on that and been like, oh, this must be like an abridged version or something that doesn't have the full <laughs> ending on this. Um, no, that is that is what I would change it to. Meg lives and Moe's ending would go in on that. <laughs> Okay, second question. What new still to be released in 2024 book are you most looking forward to, Tiana? I'm going to start by cheating on this question and choosing a book that recently got published. Okay. So still 2024, yeah. still new. Yep. 
but already published. And it's uh, Mislaid in Parts Half Known. So it's the latest book in the Wayward Children series by Shannon McGuire. And it's a series, every book you get like different characters and they go through a little portal and end up in a world. And it's a bunch of novellas. Which uh, which book number is that? Like how many books have they Ooh, I released? I think this one is seven, wow. maybe. There's like one a year. Oh, cool. you, get, you get one at the beginning of every single year. And they're just short little novellas, but they're very fun. So this one, they go into a little dinosaur world with a ghost person. It is adult. It is adult fantasy. I know portals and children can be. Yeah, it's very fun. <laughs> Bryce, is there um, a retired sports figure <laughs> who has a book coming out? I'm sure there probably is, uh, but I didn't, in my research, I didn't come across one that really interested me too much. But um, I'm actually going with uh, another biography, um, and it's uh, from actually Michael Richards' biography called Entrances and Exits. Uh, So I believe it's coming out in June. So Michael Richards, of course, most people know him as Kramer from Seinfeld. So uh, a couple things really interest me about this book. One is um, obviously is a huge Seinfeld nerd. I'd love to get some behind the scenes uh, stories about the show. Um, There's not a lot out there, it seems like. So um, yeah, I think it would be really interesting. And of course, everybody knows about that horrible stand-up set he did. So um, yeah, just be like, what was he thinking? And um, yeah, I guess uh, maybe hearing about the aftermath of that and maybe what he's learned from it. So uh, that's my pick anyway. uh, Caroline, how about you? I'm really looking forward to The Friday Afternoon Club, a memoir by Griffin Dunn, who is an Mm. actor and uh, director, uh, son of Dominic Dunn. Uh, His sister, Dominique, was uh, murdered in Hollywood. She was an actress. And uh, yeah, it's just is a glimpse into the life that he grew up in uh, with... um, you know, a lot of names that people would recognize. And then his experience of being part of a a famous kind of family that has had so much of their life play out in front of people. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to it. I think it, you know, thinking of distance with it. And again, some of it is, is what you were saying, Bryce, that I think, there's been so much he's experienced in his life and I, and, and there has been, I think some time to reflect and, and get some perspective on it. And so the memoir that he's writing now would have been very different than if it had been, you know, at the time of the trial for his sister's mm-hmm. killer or something like that. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of seeing what, what that is like. So that's the Friday afternoon club that comes out later this year. Nice. Great. So, Tiana, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I really enjoyed being able to talk about these endings and get some of these things out there on the record. Um, Is there anything coming up uh, at the Clairview Library that you'd like our listeners to know about? Yeah. So on Saturday, April 27th at 2 p.m., we have a Medieval Arms and Armor program. So here's our description of this. Experience the life of a knight by learning about medieval arms and armor from Sir Thomas of Strathcona with the Knights of the Northern Realm, which is a local 14th century living history group. So he's going to bring in a bunch of arms and armor and people come and get to experience it, which is something we don't often have at the library. And I'm very excited for it. We've run that program at uh, some of our other branches as well. I think uh, Meadows in particular, I think, is where it started. But um, yeah, that's such a cool idea for a program. And uh, I know not just kids, but you know, adults too come in and they, they absolutely love it and getting to learn about this armor and everything. It's such a cool program. It is for family. Everyone can come. There is no age limits. Why should kids get to have all the fun? They shouldn't. Everybody should have fun. <laughs> We are just hitting all the greatest hits today on Overdue Fine. We are cramming every last one in to uh, the show before we wrap up. 
yeah, before we wrap up here, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you want me to go first or Caroline. If I don't know if there's any kind of last final things you wanna you wanna say. Yeah, I just, I mean, I want to uh, give a big thank you to uh, everyone who has been part of Overdue Finds over the years, the people who support it behind the scenes, the editors uh, who... <laughs> Honestly, with the first couple times I listened to an edited version of the podcast, I was like, oh, I thought I sounded, a, I thought I was a bit more scattered in the record, but this sounds really great. And then it <laughs> clicked in that that's because we have an amazing um, team of editors and the people who put the list together, the people uh, in marketing and, and production who supported it, the award winning design team who uh, created the look of the podcast. Um, I reached out to our overdue fine statistics department and they were a little shaky on the numbers but over 70 epl staff members have been guests on the show over the years we've had a dozen or so writers in residence featured writers and a musician in residence um eight forward thinking speaker series uh guests nine if you include rain wilson as our fundraising guest um on that and so all of the people who put those events together and signed the contracts that allowed us to talk to those those people um yeah just a big big thank you to everyone uh behind the scenes uh and to all of the listeners and uh yeah to you know you the podcast wouldn't have been anything if you hadn't started it Bryce and I've just been so <laughs> grateful to be uh on this journey with you starting from episode 25 26ish um and just you know never letting go so yeah it's been a lot of fun <laughs> yeah and uh thank you to you as well Caroline I know that uh you stepped in and did an awesome awesome job and it's been so fun getting to work with you here over the over the last few years and uh not just uh chatting about stuff that we enjoy and just getting to know you and uh yeah hearing from um yeah just kind of getting book recommendations and everything it's been it's been so fun and uh really appreciate all the work that you've done on the show as well just bringing so many fantastic ideas um yeah and i also want to give a shout out to our as caroline mentioned we have an awesome team of editors here and uh, people who do up our show notes so give a quick shout out to our overdue finds team slash family uh elton rayner maria milanowski Anurit uh, Mangat, uh, Aaron Hardy Belair, Pilar Medrano, and uh, Tomislav uh, Gallic, who does an awesome job editing. Um, also want to give a shout out to a few other people as well. Uh, our former marketing director, Anna Alfonso, really kind of pushed and challenged me to uh, get the podcast going after, you know, just a casual brainstorming meeting and marketing. I was like, we should do a podcast. And then, you know, five years later, you know, we've got like over 150 episodes. So uh, big thanks to Anna for uh, being a champion of that. Uh, shout out to, to uh, my first co-host, uh, Kim Bates. And she also too really helped kind of uh, when we we're talking about doing the podcast and kind of putting it together. What does the show look like? And uh, I definitely wouldn't have been able to do it uh, by myself. Uh, also to, to Alison De Silva, who had uh, filled in on a couple episodes to co-host and actually was the person who came up with the name overdue fine. So thank you, Allison. Um, and also too, like you mentioned, uh, Caroline, so many staff have been on. I didn't realize it was like over 70 staff members who have been on since, uh, the start of the podcast. So, uh, which is, which is incredible. So, uh, thank you to all the staff, yourself included, Tiana, for, uh, coming on the show and being so enthusiastic about overdue fines. Uh, quick shout out though to, uh, some past guests who have been on the show a lot and have contributed so much to the show. I'm thinking of my best friend, Kate Gibson, uh, Holly Arneson, Beth Kilfoy. Uh, there's so many others uh, who have uh, been on so many episodes. Uh, Camila Fida, who is no longer with EPL, but played a huge role in uh, being on so many episodes and doing so many, so much editing for us. And of course, the biggest shout out goes out to uh, our listeners. So huge thank you um, for us getting to do this for 
over 157 episodes, counting bonus episodes. I think we're close to 170. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. You know, even if you just started listening to us, we hope you're able to go back into our archives and find episodes, uh, that you enjoy. Um, kind of the whole thing with the podcast was, you know, we try not to make it too timely, but you know, I think these episodes will still kind of, uh, you know, stand on their own. So if you're like, eh, I'm a Stephen King fan, you can go back and check out certain episodes. So, um, yeah, we wouldn't have made it to, you know, 150 episodes, over 150 episodes without the support from our listeners. So, um, yeah, huge, huge thank you to everybody. And just because uh, Overdue Finds, the podcast won't be releasing new episodes regularly. Um, that does not mean EPL, the library, won't keep having great stuff. So uh, you can, there are so many ways for you to continue discovering new and new to you books and movies and music. Bryce, we're going to have to up our music game now that we don't mm -hmm. have the podcast keeping us accountable. <laughs> um, but, you know, things like our, our catalog, epl.ca. You can also sign up for our newsletter. Check out things like the uh, online personal picks where you can make a request um, and get a list of ideas emailed directly to you. So you can find all of that, as well as information about our incredible databases, Canopy, for uh, streaming movies. They've given us lots of content for the show. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we've given them some love on that. So, uh, yeah, uh, just you can find so much at epl.ca or the next time you're in your local branch, talk to the staff and uh, find out what they've been enjoying or see what has a staff picks sticker on it. Because as much as Bryce and I love to talk about these things, the 70 plus guests um, also represent a whole staff at EPL that is passionate about what we share. So, uh, yeah, this might be our the end of the podcast but it is not the end of great stuff from epl absolutely uh so this is usually where i would tell everyone to subscribe um i guess if you do you would get maybe anything in the future if it's in the feed but mm -hmm. more importantly leave us a review on apple podcasts and uh maybe share this with a friend as well absolutely please do and uh my my little notes for anybody listening, if there's podcasts that you enjoy listening to, I'm not just talking about Overdue Finds, but any other podcast, um, it is so important uh, for you to just leave a quick review and just be like, I love this podcast. And it helps so many podcasts get get discovered and everything. So uh, if there's anything, if I can leave a please do before we leave, I would be go to your favorite podcast leave a very brief uh, review on their show. Cause I know as a podcast creator and, and somebody who, you know, creates content uh, for obviously the library and, and this show that uh, it's, it's appreciated so much. So um, as usual, of course, we will have a link to everything that we talked about in today's show notes. There's going to be lots of links to fantastic books with great endings. And of course, maybe not so great endings. And you can still email Caroline and myself at podcast at epl.ca and you can uh, maybe share your picks for best and worst endings with us thank you for listening and we'll see you at the library <laughs> <laughs>